Um, so we are joined to today by human rights experts, um, Alena Lunova and Katerina Rashevska. Um, they represent uh, two of Ukraine's leading human rights institutions. Um, this is the Zmina Human Rights NGO. And, um, and, and the Re uh, Regional Center for Human Rights. Um, they cooperate together in the 5 a.m. coalition. So as we're waiting for our guests to um, to come on in, let's um, just, uh, Alona and Katarina, could you please uh, briefly tell about your work um, over this last year, how you work to document Russian war crimes, um, uh, how this work looks like as part of the 5 a.m. coalition. Um, what do you do? How do you do it? And how does this help bring Russia to justice? Uh, maybe I can start. Hello uh, for everyone. Um, My name is... Uh, do you hear me? <laughs> yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, hi for everyone. My name is Alona Lunyova. I'm the um, Advocacy Director of Human Rights Center Zmina. Our organization, in the more than 10 years, have been working in the sphere of human rights protected in protection in Ukraine since the beginning of the full-scale invasion in last February. We, with our colleagues, started the coalition of human rights organization, which called Ukraine 5 AM. Uh, coalition and now um, our members count more than 30 human rights, prominent human rights organizations and also individual experts. Um, we work with different issues and try to document war crimes which have been committed by Russia during this war. And uh, deportation is uh, the most probably widespread um, war crime which committed by Russians uh, during this war and we try to deport, uh, we try to document through you know, interview with the survivors and also um, through analytic uh, analysis of open data source try to find out what exactly Russia does with the, our citizens when they uh, deported on the territory of Russia Federation. Also, we try to monitor Russia officials' websites, propaganda channels, uh, in order to understand the the idea and uh, actually the goal of the deportation. Because it's the most, you know, the main question why they try to deport all our so all those people, all thousands, thousands of Ukrainians from the territory of Ukraine to the territory of Russia Federation. Mm -hmm. um, Alona, could you please tell us why is it called the 5 a.m. coalition? What's behind the name? Oh, behind the name, the time when uh, we all uh, open our eyes. <laughs> uh, last February, on 24th of February, actually, and 5 a.m., the time when shellings uh, were over the Ukraine and we were under rocket attacks. And that's why the, this is the time. Uh, uh, of the full-scale invasion have been starting for most of us. And that's the name, the, the, the source of the name of the coalition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's the time when everything changed. Um, thank you. Uh, and Katerina Rashevska, are you with us now? Yes, I am with us. Oh, Do you hear yes. me? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Um, so, please, a uh, brief introduction. Tell us about yourself, about your organization, and how you work in the 5 a.m. coalition. How do you document Russian war crimes? Uh, to start, uh, I would like just add uh, something to this uh, name, Ukraine 5 a.m. coalition. You know, uh, this is also like allusion uh, to the events uh, which... Uh, uh, the, um, uh, occurred uh, in the territory of the occupied Crimea uh, because uh, all these searches, uh, all these uh, political motivated proceedings uh, started also at 5 a.m. like usually. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. uh, like uh, one other reason why it's Ukraine 5 a.m. coalition. Uh, so... Mm -hmm. 
To introduce myself, I am Katerina Rashevska. I'm a legal expert at the Regional Center for Human Rights. Our organization uh, was created in 2013 in Sebastopol, but uh, of course, since the beginning of the occupation, we were forced to move to Kiev uh, because of the fear of persecution, first of all. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, we focused mostly on the legal issues related to the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula because uh, uh, our main feature is uh, that uh, we are an organization of professional lawyers. So we submitted uh, 14 communications to the ICC, International Criminal Court. We protected uh, victims uh, of uh, um, mass human rights violations uh, and uh, of international crimes in the European Court of Human Rights, uh, also in the United Nations Human Rights Committee. Uh, but uh, uh, since the beginning of large scale invasion, of course, uh, the focus of our activity was expanded. And uh, now uh, we not only document uh, uh, these war crimes, crimes against humanity, and even uh, uh, elements of the crime of genocide, but also provide uh, all these uh, results of uh, documenting process with uh, legal analysis. Because, you know, documentation only for documentation is not enough. We would like mm -hmm. to implement the victim-centric approach in all these processes of equality uh, and uh, just compensation our victims with uh, a stable guarantee of non-repetition. Uh, so we are working on this field. We submitted uh, uh, our 15th communication to the RCC related to this uh, forcible transfer of Ukrainian children, uh, mostly to Russian families. But uh, of course, in this communication, we are we were dealing also with uh, many cases of deportations and uh, forcible transfer of Ukrainian minors to Russia and uh, to the territories under control of the Russian Federation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of talk about creating a tribunal for the Russian leadership. Um, are your organizations involved in such plans? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, at the level of our coalition, we have even like uh, our unified idea how this tribunal should be created, uh, what uh, jurisdiction, what competence. Uh, we are trying to advocate our idea because, you know, now uh, there is like only uh, some concept without uh, any concrete details. And uh, this problem of the absence of details provoke that some countries at the international level uh, they refused to uh, it's not uh, like refused but uh, they abstained uh, to um, maintain this uh, concept because uh, they uh, currently don't understand uh, what is a special tribunal in the case of Ukraine so we are trying to provide uh, them and also our national competent bodies with uh, analytical materials on this issue mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're working to make the tribunal a reality and not just an interesting concept, right? Yes, of course. We, we don't have enough time to wait, uh, uh, I don't know, one, two or three years because, uh, you know, all these high-ranking officials uh, in Russia, uh, they are aged enough. So Putin uh, can uh, die <laughs> before the special tribunal will be created. And uh, in this case, uh, what uh, victims of his crime uh, will do? So we, mm -hmm. we don't have enough time to wait. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, you're falling out a little bit. If you have the chance to maybe find some better internet, uh, it would be very helpful. Um, okay, so let's start with our today's topic um, about deportations. So, Katerina and Alyona, maybe you could tell us briefly, um, what is the state of the case? Where are the deportations happening? How many Ukrainian citizens are affected? How many have been deported to Russia? where they go, and how can we actually know how many people are deported if it's um, so difficult to penetrate the occupied territories? Uh, maybe I will start. Um, mm -hmm. As I said before, uh, we thought that the deportation is the most massive international crime committed by Russians on the territory of Ukraine. And uh, yes, we do not know the scale of the numbers, the exact numbers of those who have been deported, but we understand the massive, um, the massive uh, trends to deport Ukrainians. 
Um, unfortunately, Ukraine uh, doesn't have uh, its own source of information about the temporary uh, because we do not uh, we do not control the part of Russia Ukrainian border. So that's why we do not have our source of information about numbers of crossing the border. Um, but according to UNHCR data, there is 2.8 million Ukrainian citizens who are registered in the territory of Russia. According to Russia source, uh, it's more than 5.3 million Ukrainians, including more than 700,000 children, arrived from the territory of Ukraine. We do not know how many of those people are really stand on the territory of Russia Federation, how many just people, people just used this as a um, way for get, uh, get away to the territory of more safety state. A European state, for example, so we do not know exact number. But at the same time, we know um, the scope, we know, know the approach of, of Russians who try to deport as many people as they can. They try to create the atmosphere of fear on the occupied territories and also they um, provide this deportation of uh, of the closed institutions, and we see the trend on the Kharkiv and Kherson regions, but deportation occurred on the territory of Kyiv, Sumy, Chernigiv, Kharkiv, Donetsk, Lugansk, and Kherson regions, so all regions which have been under control uh, of uh, Russia, uh, Russia troops at some time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you are saying that basically Russia's main goal is just to instill fear in the population and intimidate it. Um, but what about population replacement? Is that something that Russia is trying to do to get all the Ukrainians, active Ukrainians out of the out of Ukraine in order to populate it with Russians? Um. Right now, I can can see it's if Katerina is still muted. Um, actually, maybe Katerina, do you want to yes, ask? Something? Yes, yes. I I I want to, to add something uh, to previous uh, information just to clarify. Uh, because uh, among uh, these children, the number of these children, uh, there are different categories of uh, uh, children, of minors. Uh, among them, uh, children, uh, orphans, and children deprived of parental care. And I am sure that uh, uh, we will discuss uh, this issue during uh, our event today. Uh, and uh, also, when we are talking about this problem related to the main goal of the Russian Federation, why they uh, uh, implement this policy of deportations, replacement, forcible transfer, uh, you know, Putin in January 2023, uh, he um, provided us uh, with uh, all information about this uh, task. Uh, so he told us that uh, uh, there is a, a huge uh, demographic problem in uh, the Russian Federation. So maybe they would like to uh, ameliorate the situation. Thanks for, for example, our children. Of course, the main goal is to eradicate the Ukrainian national identity both in newly occupied territories, in territories uh, which are under occupation since 2014, and uh, also to, to try to uh, like to create uh, additional value for future in long term perspective because uh, you know with this uh, process of Russification of militarization of indoctrina- indoctrination uh, they can provoke uh, uh, for us uh, unfortunately internal conflict because uh, for these uh, children who will become adults the situation won't be like for children who still now in Ukraine uh, they can can start that maybe in Russia, with Russia, Ukraine uh, will have uh, uh, the best future, um, better than with the European Union and so on, because they're indoctrinated. So um, mm-hmm. I am I'm sure that we need some reintegration policy for these uh, children and also even for adults who were deplaced uh, to Russia or to territories under Russian control. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the key key thing that they are targeting is the Ukrainian national identity. That sounds um, like a pretty grim picture. Um, so um, 
but I mean, you told that it was, it's very hard to estimate how many people were deported, but could you just give us an approximate range? How, what is the scale that we're talking about? Is it thousands? Is it millions? Problem, uh, pro uh, if, probably, uh, probably. Okay. I don't know, you, okay. you can tell, and then I will. Okay. We know um, the part of information, for example, about numbers of uh, those who have been deported from the closed institutions, and this this thousands of Ukrainians, and also we know how many people probably crossed uh, ukrainian russia border, but uh, we do not know how many people right now in the territory of Russia Federation. At the same time, Russia Federation at the beginning of the full-scale invasion created so-called accommodation points for Ukrainians. On the Russia territory, it's more than 500 points all around the Russia Federation and also on the territory of the occupied Crimea. And we know, uh, according to Russia sources, that there are 40,000 Ukrainians right now uh, in these points, mm -hmm. centers. So, we, so it's a really big gap between millions about which uh, Russians deport, uh, reported, say about 5.3 million Ukrainians who, who are right now on the territory of Russia Federation, but also 40,000 need some accommodations on the, on the Russia territory. So... So we do not exact number, and I can just repeat it again and again, that it's really hard to know about numbers of mm -hmm. all people who have been deported. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, what place does the deportation of closed institutions have in this picture? And what are these closed institutions? Could you tell us, please? Uh, I can start uh, mostly with uh, children, orphans, and children deprived of parental care who were in the special boarding institutions uh, since the beginning of the large-scale invasion, and then they uh, were like uh, the first victims of uh, this policy of the Russian Federation because, uh, you know, uh, from the so-called DPR and LPR, uh, children were deported to Russia even before uh, large-scale invasion, so since uh, February 18. Uh, and uh, numbers of uh, uh, number of these children deported to Russia uh, is also varies uh, from uh, two thousand five hundred and even maybe two uh, six thousand children. And I can explain why I provide you with this uh, number because it's not so frequent information. Uh, but this number uh, two thousand five hundred uh, was. Um, like um, many times repeated by our parental officials, uh, also we can uh, find this uh, information on the Rus uh, at the Russian sources. Uh, but you know, if we will calculate the number of children who were in this uh, uh, 702 special boarding institutions before the large scale invasion, and then uh, when uh, we will uh, calculate the number of children evacuated by uh, uh, Ukrainian side. Uh, we can understand that uh, like the difference is uh, 5,000 children. So, and now, for example, UNICEF um, has some problem with identification of uh, 26,000 Ukrainian children who were allegedly evacuated by Ukraine, but uh, they are not sure. So the number of children transferred to Russian special boarding institutions can be higher than uh, we uh, have uh, now in official statistics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And well, I uh, want to, and I mm -hmm. want to add about institution for adults because um, in Ukraine we have special institution for adults, geriatric consent, um, institution, and also institutions for adults who have physical, psycho, neurological diseases. And uh, we know about several of those institutions which have been deported on the, from the territory of Kherson region. And also from Kherson region, Russians deported three colon, penal colonies uh, with uh, at least 2,500 people. And right now, all those prisoners uh, are in prison on the territory of Russia Federation, in Krasnodar region, for example, in Stavropol uh, region. And uh, we know about these people because right now they ask about help, about assistance, for assistance, because they want to come back to the territory of Ukraine, but they actually can't. 
uh, even if the term of imprisonment uh, ended uh, and uh, they want to come back, but they do not have documents uh, very often. And uh, Russian Federation just imprisoned them uh, once again because they, according to Russian officials, they uh, illegally crossed the uh, Ukrainian-Russian border. Yes, and yes. I would like uh, to add here, uh, so this policy of uh, deportations of uh, prisoners started since 2014, 14, uh, since the beginning of the occupation of the Crimean Peninsula, and uh, our organization, Regional Center for Human Rights, um, is uh, working on this issue especially, and uh, we know that uh, now, as of today, uh, at least 15,000 prisoners only from the Crimean Peninsula were transferred to uh, 38 uh, regions of the Russian Federation uh, to at least 102 uh, colonies, detention centers. So, you know, the scope of these deportations is uh, really uh, expanded. And also what is uh, really important is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, Ukraine uh, has managed to repatriate only 12 <laughs> prisoners 12 you imagine uh, and it was only in 2017 thanks for some political mechanism uh, so it's very difficult to return Ukrainian prisoners because they are also victims of um, uh, forcible passportization so they were recognized forcibly as uh, Russian citizens uh, and now the Russian Federation of course refused to, to return them and the same situation unfortunately is with children with these closed institutions because they were also forcibly uh, recognized uh, citizen of the Russian Federation and uh, now uh, it's very difficult to repatriate them because uh, uh, we need some cooperation uh, between Ukraine and uh, Russia. We need to appoint some special legal representative for all these uh, children and uh, this is not uh, really easy. We, we need some assistance in this. Mm -hmm. Well, w with children, I can imagine that their goal is to assimilate these children to boost the um, to the demographic situation somehow. But with prisoners, I mean, there there's a lot of care involved in in, in uh, maintaining prisoners. What 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 goal do they pursue with deporting prisons? These are people that will have to will stay behind bars for many years, and it'll. I mean, this this is also it's expenditures from the state budget. What 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 are they aiming at with interpretation of prisons? Uh, there are some objective uh, uh, reasons for this. Uh, for example, the lack of uh, enough number of detention centers in uh, Crimea, when we are talking about Crimea or in other occupied territories. Uh, but also, I know that uh, the Russian Federation, especially these private military uh, initiatives, uh, they are trying to uh, draft these uh, people into Russian army, into this uh, uh, special forces in order to use them, you know, against their proper nation. It's the same thing like with forcible conscription in occupied territories. Oh. So they can, they want to use them like cannon fodder. That, that's amazing. That's that's just incredible. They're deporting Ukrainians to Russia in order to, to then recruit them to the Russian army to fight as cannon fodder. That is, uh, I have no words. Um, okay, so um, with, um, could you tell us briefly um, how does how does this path look like? So imagine there is an orphanage in occupied Ukrainian territories. Um, how does the deportation process look like, and what institutions are involved along the way? I've heard that the Russian Orthodox Church is involved um, in in settling uh, these deported people, uh, these deported Ukrainians in Russia. Does that correspond to your data? 
so I can start. Maybe Alona will uh, add something next. Uh, I will start with this uh, deportations of uh, orphanages and uh, other special boarding institutions. So as I have already mentioned, this process started even before the large scale invasion. Uh, they uh, deported uh, our children to at least 57 uh, regions of the Russian Federation, even uh, regions uh, situated uh, uh, far from uh, Ukraine and it's prohibited under international law. Uh, these children were transferred, for example, to Murmansk region, to Sakhalin, uh, to Siberia, uh, to Vladivostok, some of them. So we have this um, uh, special boarding institutions where our children are now, but uh, unfortunately these children are under huge risk to be also victims of uh, forcible transfer to Russian families. And as of uh, 2022, we have uh, recorded at least uh, 400 cases of uh, uh, illegal establishment of foster care. But since October 2022, uh, there, are, there are no obstacles in order to adopt these children. So uh, now it's it's not foster care, it's uh, really adoption under the Russian legislation. So the total number of children transferred to Russian families is uh, unknown because uh, the process of uh, adoption is under the secrecy according to Russian legislation. And also after this process, uh, parents uh, changed the uh, uh, the personal data of uh, these Ukrainian children. So it is very difficult to identify. Children, uh, teenagers uh, uh, were also transferred um, uh, first to special uh, re-education camps. We know that uh, this was uh, the idea to re-educate these children, to uh, try to eradicate the um, national identity and uh, conditions in these camps uh, are very hard. Uh, we also know that in this process of uh, deportations, not only Maria Lvova Belova, Russian children ombudsman, but also at least 28 regional ombudsmen participate. Also, we know about the role of uh, Russian governors. It's uh, at least uh, uh, 16 governors, some of them, seven uh, especially they are now under the sanctions of the European Union. Also, when we're talking about uh, Russian Orthodox Church, it's a key role, you know, it's a crucial role of the Russian Orthodox Church. They are even created special unit inside uh, the system, institutional system of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, special unit in order to... Uh, find for uh, these uh, children, Russian families, uh, in order to facilitate this process of illegal adoption. Also, the Russian Orthodox Church encourages uh, Russians uh, to uh, bring these children. Uh, they also encourage these children to accept this process of illegal adoption. Also, we know that uh, Russian Orthodox Church participates uh, very actively in the process of the so-called uh, studies for future uh, families for these kids and you know uh, this um meetings with representatives of the Russian Orthodox Church, uh, they are like, uh, um, they, they should be in order to uh, be resource families. And also these meetings are like uh, um, important uh, component of uh, this policy of re-education of our Ukrainian children because uh, uh, these uh, children testified that during these camps uh, they had uh, several meetings with uh, representatives of the Russian Orthodox Church. And then there are no other families for these uh, children. These children are transferred to families of Russian priests. So the role uh, and uh, I, am, uh, I am not talking about I am not even talking about of the role of the Russian religious propaganda in all this process of the eradication of Ukrainian national identity. Wow, that's um, <clears throat> I wasn't aware that the Russian Orthodox Church played such a central role. Um, do you know what happens in the re-education camps? What do they try to do? What, what do they do with the kids? Yes, uh, I had several meetings with uh, children who were returned uh, to Ukraine, thanks for private initiatives, uh, thanks for our civic society. And uh, these children who are aged of uh, 10 or 11 years, 
uh, they are even not understand clearly that they are victims of this crime, that they were forcibly transferred and then they were forcibly detained in these camps. Uh, they were prohibited to speak Ukrainian. Uh, they were um, taught to, to uh, love the Russian Federation, to sing Russian anthem. Uh, they were militarized. You know, these uh, children uh, preferred to take uh, uh, toy guns and not some other toy uh, in order to play with me. Uh, and uh, I think that this is a clear example how this uh, program of militarization and of indoctrination of our Ukrainian children works and looks like. But the children, teenagers, uh, with them the situation was really difficult because uh, uh, like uh, these small children, uh, they were also prohibited to speak Ukrainian, but uh, uh, they uh, refused to accept this rule, so they were punished. They were also punished uh, in groups because of uh, the fact that they refused to sing Russian anthem, and they were forced to sing this, uh, this anthem not only uh, like one time for a day, but uh, twice or even three times for a day, so they refused, of course, to do it. Uh, they uh, also were treated very badly uh, by the side of uh, Russian teenagers because uh, um, in violation of the rule of international humanitarian law, these children were detained together with the Russian children. Uh, so these uh, children, uh, like, uh, told them uh, uh, some things uh, as "Kochlushka, uh, kochol, we are better, uh, you are bad, and so on." Uh, so there are many uh, such facts, uh, and of course, these uh, children were deprived of. Um, uh, mobile phones, so their parents, many of parents uh, even didn't know where exactly their children were. Uh, this uh, was a real problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm sure that the Russians will just claim that they're taking these children to safety, that they're taking the other closed institutions to safety. But how do human rights organizations prove that this is actually a deportation? And um, how can we say that deportation is a war crime? Are there any conventions that prohibit such acts during war? Um, maybe I will start and Katerina with that. Uh, we know that this is deportation because we try to qualify those actions. The Russian side usually said that this is evacuation, so they try to save our children, our adults, just to save their lives. That's why they provide some uh, buses or some ways to, 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 to let them go to the territory of Russian Federation. But first of all, we know that all humanitarian corridors which can connect the occupied territories and the territory which is under uh, uh, under government uh, of Ukraine control uh, have been closed. Uh, for example, we haven't had any such corridors from the territory of Kherson region. So that's usually why people have just only way to escape the occupied territories, just uh, go on the territory of Russian Federation. Second is the atmosphere of fear on the territory of uh, which have been occupied by Russian troops and uh, people uh, sometimes people uh, directly have been threatened that um, they will uh, they will die under shellings and for example um, they will kill by uh, Ukrainian troops if uh, it was the time before libera liberation of areas for example it, we documented such uh, uh, such a situation in Kherson and Kharkiv region. We've spoken with the people who would, who have been deported from the territory of Russian Federation, and they said us that uh, Russian um, military just came in the middle of the night and said that they need to uh, grab their belongings and just uh, be on the center of the village because it's evacuation, because Ukrainians will kill you if you do not want to evacuate. You, sh you can't just wait it's, uh, Ukrainian here. So uh, we document such, uh, we, we document different um, different uh, kinds of um, uh, of evidence that this is not evacuation and uh, this is deportation because it was under the fear and was under the threats 
uh, this process. And obvious, it wasn't a, uh, an evacuation if we speak about closed institution because people in the closed institution can't uh, choose anything. They under full control of uh, they under the state control, but uh, during the occupation they uh, were under uh, occupied authorities control and they can't just um, choose anything. They need uh, or they can be just grabbed and sent whatever the Russians want to send them. Mm -hmm. uh, and also when we're talking about qualification, legal qualification, of course, it's not evacuation. Uh, the Russian Federation is trying to manipulate uh, these uh, provisions of the Geneva Convention and also of the additional protocol one to Geneva Conventions. But, you know, uh, if uh, it is evacuation, the Russian Federation should provide at least the ICRC uh, with the, uh, very detailed informational card for each child deported to the territory of the Russian Federation. We know that uh, there are no cards uh, for children in uh, these institutions. Also, the Russian Federation refused to provide uh, free access uh, to this process of the so-called evacuation to independent uh, non-governmental and governmental organizations. And also, they refused to um, provide uh, uh, like safe access to humanitarian corridors in order to evacuate this institution by Ukrainian side. So it's not evacuation because uh, it's not under the international humanitarian law. And uh, this is uh, um, international crime, uh, two crimes uh, uh, by the same time. It's a war crime and a uh, crime against humanity, uh, deportations mm -hmm. and forcible transfer. But, uh, you know, the problem was with this... Uh, the so-called trust, yes, in uh, re-education camps. Uh, because we know that uh, uh, parents uh, gave a consent to this uh, transfer. But uh, we should understand the scope of this consent, firstly, and uh, conditions uh, in which this consent uh, uh, was obtained. So uh, this consent uh, doesn't prevent, uh, doesn't include that these children uh, will be in uh, uh, in the territory of the Russian Federation during uh, two, three months uh, uh, without any information for parents via their children. Are. Of course, it's not under this consent. And also the Russian Federation uh, through this consent, the Russian Federation uh, was uh, obligated to return these children in time. But of course, these children uh, were or are still detained by Russians in these re-education camps. So also this is not about consent. But we also know that uh, some parents were threatened by Russian military, by Russian occupation authorities, or uh, they were persuaded by Ukrainian collaborators in order to give such a consent. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, Mm, uh, one uh, thing that can help us to prove that uh, it was you no know, infor a very informed consent, and according to international law, this consent is like is nothing. Uh, without informed consent, without uh, uh, these uh, conditions, where parents uh, uh, had choice uh, to transfer the children or not to transfer, uh, these are deportations and not uh, uh, rest. Mm, the problem is also that now Russia created additional pretext in order to deport Ukrainian children to Russia. Uh, this is the so-called medical examinations, medical assistance, and um, the problem is that uh, such conditions in order to transfer children is included into the text of the Geneva Convention. So it's like legal, but you know, it is legal only if Ukraine gives consent. And of course, Ukraine cannot give such a consent. And of course, Ukraine uh, have all, has all facilities in order to uh, provide this medical assistance uh, to our Ukrainian children without Russia. So this is also illegally. Oh, let's stop a bit about on the Orwellian re-education camps. If we may, can, can we just call them what they are, brainwashing camps? Um, do you think they can actually succeed? Do you think that children can be taught to hate Ukraine? 
It's a very interesting question because uh, in order to understand this, uh, I should uh, have uh, uh, some meetings not only with some returned children, yes, with some part, but with all of them. Or we should uh, like carry out some analysis. Without uh, this analysis, uh, it's really difficult to conclude. But I think that uh, if these children are in the territory under control of the Russian Federation, uh, they also have these classes uh, according to Russian curriculum, uh, you know, yes, they are indoctrinated and we need special program of reintegration for them. And when we are talking about children who were in these uh, camps uh, uh, since 2013, uh, because, you know, uh, for example, Belarus, uh, uh, Russia, uh, uh, high-ranking officials of uh, Belarus, they told that uh, these children from the so-called DPR and LPR uh, were in uh, Belarus, Belarusian sanatoriums and uh, uh, camps uh, not only since 2022, but since 2021, and in Russia also. So, uh, you know, this process started already, and uh, even before the large-scale invasion, and uh, they like tested this program in order to indoctrinate our children. And I think that with these uh, instruments and means of Russian propaganda, unfortunately, they can receive some results. And you know, these children, uh, especially aged of 10, 11 years old, they uh, uh, were returned from these camps with presents presence made by Russians. So they were happy. As I already mentioned, they didn't understand that they were victims. So this is a problem. Oh, that sounds terrible. Um, so maybe could you walk us through the story of a child that returned? Maybe you have, um, I'm sure that you've been working with many specific children and specific families. Um, is there a case that you could tell us so we could imagine being this child that was deported and came back? Mm, so this uh, uh, children, uh, they are really different, uh, but uh, uh, I was very impressed by the story of one girl. Uh, she is 10 years old. She was transferred uh, first in one camp, the so-called re-education camp. Uh, then uh, she was uh, in three other camps uh, in Crimea. And she told me that she cried every day and every night because she would like to be with her mother. Uh, and this process of uh, her return was very difficult with uh, many obstacles uh, created by the Russian Federation on the border uh, with Belarus. Uh, so this uh, girl, uh, she she's really good and she refused to speak uh, Russian. She was punished by these Russian monitors, but she is like my hero and she is like me in my uh, childhood because uh, I, when I was a child, I also cried in this camps because I would like to be with my parents and not in this camp. So I can understand this fear that you even don't know when you will be returned. And these children were told that in Ukraine uh, there is a very difficult situation, there is escalation of hostilities, so their parents were incapable to uh, bring them back to Ukraine. And I can understand this fear when you don't know when you will be at home. So th this is uh, the story of this uh, girl. Uh, and uh, she is now very popular. She gave many interviews for uh, French and uh, American uh, channels. <laughs> but uh, her story is really great. Mm -hmm. Where did, was she deported from? I'm sorry, this girl. What territory was she deported from? What? Uh, Katarina, uh, could you tell us what territory she was deported from? What part mm -hmm. of the uh, From Kherson region. Okay, from Kherson, and she was brought to Belarus. So Belarus is no, an active no, participant. No, she, she, no? she, was, she was brought to Crimea, to, oh, three, to, Crimea. to three di uh, different camps in Crimea. Okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. And, but you mentioned and Belarus I, also, but uh, Belarus is, uh, uh, it takes part in this process, right, of... Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, there are at least four uh, camps and sanatoriums in Belarus, and uh, 
uh, in the period of 2021-2022, at least 5,000 Ukrainian children from the so-called DPR and LPR were in these camps. Uh, they mm-hmm. have the same program of re-education as uh, our Ukrainian children in uh, Crimean camps or in Russian camps because of this process of uh, uh, their indoctrination in Belarus uh, is uh, directed from Kremlin and all financial resources uh, uh, are also from the federal budget of the Russian Federation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, Leona, you wanted to add something? Yes. yes. Yes, uh, actually, yes, we work with different cases of um, uh, providing a way home for those who have been deported to the territory of Russia Federation. Firstly, it's a question of the documents, because uh, really it's uh, the often situation when children uh, do not have any documents of the First of all, the certificate of um, birth and also this uh, passport, which can provide the possibility to cross the border. But I want to share with you uh, one unsuccess stories uh, without happy entry now, um, because what, we, we, not, we know about the case mm-hmm. when uh, uh, the boy, uh, it's, uh, he's 13 years old, he was severely injured during evacuation from the Rubizna region. Uh, there is a um, um, convoy in which they try to reach the Ukrainian government control areas was under the shellings and his mother and the little brother was killed. Uh, and this guy, uh, this boy, 30 years old boy, uh, he was severely injured. Um, and he uh, was not deported, but he was um, forcibly displaced in the territory of Lugansk region, which have been under uh, uh, occupation since 2014. And uh, during five months, uh, we can't just uh, take him back because he have just the uh, aunt. Uh, she right now in the territory of Ukraine and she is quite ill. And she just can't uh, go through territory of Russia Federation, go to this Lugansk region to take he, him back. And uh, right now he is uh, still in the territory of Lugansk region in the hospital and he is quite alone there. Uh, but uh, nobody can um, nobody can put them him back because he is uh, uh, really the one um, close person. She's can't, she just can't um, go and make him back. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And um, so we understand, I mean, it, it's impossible for somebody from Ukraine to go into these occupied regions while fighting is going on. And of course, um, Russia does not want to allow him to travel. Is, is that, am I correct in understanding? Mm-hmm. It, He's quite small to to, okay. to be alone to cross the border, and also he's he need to be accompanied for this traveling. Uh, but this is you know common story for all these camps, um, also of the camps uh, Katerina mentioned, um, boarding schools um, in in which the children from Kherson and Kharkiv region uh, put it before liberation of the areas, and mm-hmm. that's why parents. Just, um, just separated from their children by front line, and they just can't go through the front line and through the border and take them back. And they need to have documents and all those um, um, necessary documents to have this long trip through the territory of uh, maybe uh, Poland, uh, Russia territory to to come to the territory of. Uh, about, um, territory of Russia Federation for this camp, for example, for to Anapa, Gilinjik, and others, or to the territory of Crimea, because some camps uh, we are um, indicated here some children there. Um, they need to, 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 to have this uh, long trip to take uh, these uh, children back. So is this boy that's in the hospital right now in the occupied territories, is he at risk for being adopted by Russians? Right now, he is not in the process of adoptions. Um, uh, some probably neighbor of uh, his family take um, t- take um, key officially take care of, uh, of him, but uh, probably he won't be adopted. I, I, I hope that he won't be adopted um, in the Russian Federation, and I hope his aunt will be better. Um, 
and uh, she will take him back to Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, is there any hope for repatriating um, deported Ukrainians back to Ukraine, the ones that, that are um, far away from Ukraine now, that were the ones that were transported into the various regions and maybe even adopted? Can we get these people back to Ukraine? It's a really interesting and different question uh, because uh, now, uh, as you know, as we are talking about children, uh, we have uh, managed to return only 308 children and we are talking about thousands deported children to Russia. Uh, we have only like uh, uh, private initiatives, uh, thanks for our uh, civic society, but we lack uh, one unique uh, legal or at least political mechanism in order to return children in groups. And now Alona has already mentioned, and I would like to add, is that uh, the problem with these uh, uh, children orphans and children deprived of parental care is that the Russian Federation is uh, manipulating with their status. For example, uh, this children deprived of parental care uh, they uh, have uh, here parents in Ukraine, they can have these parents, but uh, when these parents are even trying to return uh, their children from Russia the Russian Federation uh, tells that, oh, these parents are deprived of parental care according to Ukrainian legislation, so they are not legal representatives and uh, uh, we want to return these children back uh, to these parents, so they uh, don't want to return our children, that is why they refuse Refuse to cooperate with Ukraine or with uh, some uh, organization like uh, UNICEF, uh, like RCRC, and so on. But uh, we are working uh, with our coalition, Ukraine PIM coalition. We are trying to find the answer for this difficult question. We are trying to elaborate uh, this mechanism not only of repatriation, but also of rehabilitation and reintegration of these children according to existing international standards. I had uh, an advocacy trip to Brussels uh, last week, and uh, we discussed uh, uh, this uh, problem with representatives of the European Parliament, of the European Council, and so on. And uh, they promised us that uh, this uh, question with not only identification of Ukrainian children deported to Russia, but their repatriation will be like priority to the European Union because we don't have enough time. It's like with Putin and special tribunal. This is the same thing with our children because uh, children, there are many children, teenagers, uh, and uh, these uh, children uh, can be also used uh, like can order during these hostilities. Uh, so uh, these children are treated like uh, difficult children, and I am very afraid that uh, they can be forcibly conscripted into Russian army in future. Oh, that's terrible. Um, and, I, and, and if I may, yeah, if I may, I just I just saw uh, in the Telegram channel of uh, the children ombudsperson. Uh, of uh, Russian Federation Maria Lvova Bilova, the message that, um, that they are ready to give Ukraine their children. They know about 89 children who are right now on the territory of Crimea and they are ready to give them to their parents and they open and um, that Ukraine is a lie about uh, about the situation and uh, they say that they provide any any help for Ukrainians if they want to take their children back. And this is, you know, the manipulation, uh, Katya uh, is already mentioned, uh, because, of course, uh, they provide some, not restriction, but some obstacles to get these uh, children back. But at the same time, publicly, right now, they try to communicate they're quite open for Ukrainian side to give Ukrainian children back. And this is the um, the consequences of public uh, communication of this problem on the level of ICC as a war crime and if as a level of investigation of deportation of children as a war crime and also public um, discussion on the all level in European countries in the European Parliament about uh, unacceptable of deportation of Ukrainian children and I hope that we can create this uh, international mechanism, legal or political, to make our children, and not just children, but adults who have been deported to the territory of Russian Federation, to be home, to back home. Thank you. 
Um, so what can Ukraine and its international partners be doing now to help the victims of these crimes and uh, to make sure that the perpetrators are persecuted, prosecuted? There are many tasks for Ukraine, especially for Ukraine, because, uh, you know, uh, according to international law, it's Ukraine who are the first uh, subject in order to uh, firstly repatriate these uh, children and adults and then to punish all responsible persons and also uh, to guarantee uh, just compensation for all uh, these victims. Uh, so when we're talking about repatriation as of children, uh, I think that we need to, to appoint uh, uh, one competent body in order to elaborate this uh, legal mechanism in order to return children in groups. Uh, now uh, there are many, uh, at least uh, 10 national bodies uh, who may be responsible for this. And uh, this is not a case when we're talking about lack of time. We need one concrete body. Also, we need uh, like a policy of support of parents who are trying to return these children by themselves because uh, they are from occupied territories or recently they occupied territories. So they still lack money. <laughs> they still lack documents. They need special legal assistance. They need psychological assistance. So this policy of support will be great for them. Also, we have the status of children like survivors of uh, uh, armed conflicts, but this status, according to Ukrainian legislation, is vague, is poor, without standards, without guarantees, is nothing. So we need concrete, very strong status of these uh, children victims in order to guarantee them not only repatriation, but also rehabilitation and reintegration. Unfortunately, I was, um, when I discussed uh, this issue with uh, uh, parents and children themselves, they told me that uh, they uh, would like to return to Kherson, for example. Or Kherson region, <laughs> we are, uh, it's not a really a safe place in order to rehabilitate children victims of deportation and forcible transfer. And when we're talking about the process of bringing perpetrators to justice, of course, uh, uh, like Karim Khan mentioned many times, uh, this uh, protection of uh, violated children rights uh, is priority for the ICC, but the ICC cannot uh, bring all perpetrators to justice when we start from from uh, uh, guardianship institutions at the reg regional level of the Russian Federation, uh, 28 regional ombudsmen, and so on. So we need... Uh, um we need uh, some efforts at the national level. And uh, our uh, national system, unfortunately, is uh, overloaded by some other cases by... Uh, uh, frankly speaking, it's uh, more than uh, 70,000 cases of war crimes and crimes against humanity. And we have also the thousand cases of deportations. Uh, so this uh, this will be very difficult, but uh, this is not like explanation why we uh, shouldn't even try uh, to, to uh, gain this justice for victims and of course uh, just compensation we should to uh, we should to push international governments also the European Union in order to uh, not only freeze assets of the Russian Federation but also confiscate and uh, repurpose them uh, for victims needs okay so Russian money should work to um to compensate the victims, to help them recover from these terrible experiences. Um, I think we can open the floor for a few questions. Does anybody have a question? Any requests to speak? Okay, I'm not seeing any requests to speak. Um, Okay, wait, yes, I see one, just a second, just a second, hello, please speak up. Yeah, thank you, I have just one question regarding these uh, war crimes and so on. Uh, first of all, thanks for the excellent information and interesting space, has really been interesting to hear, but my, my question is that uh, if uh, the Russians who have been participating in this illegal deportations will be 
set under the threat of getting criminally prosecuted because of war crimes. Do you think that it would uh, open or cl close doors, so to say, that uh, or would it be just appeasement if uh, th that way would not be taken? Because I, I think that if hmm, I, I don't understand the Russian mindset <laughs> anyway, but but uh, I think that it might be the fear that if, if uh, they have been they will be treated and threatened uh, in a harsh way that they would sort of block and, uh, any cooperation. What are your thoughts about that? Thank you. So, Katarina, Alona. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the situation is so hard that uh, uh, to imagine the aggravation of this situation is also very difficult. Uh, now, unfortunately, the position is like uh, this. Uh, so we should be uh, like flexible in order to try to cooperate with Russia in order to return these uh, uh, children or, or adults uh, at least by a third country and so on. But, you know, we, waste, we only waste time because because sanctions with Maria Lvovila, for example, doesn't work. Uh, I am sure that with uh, all these uh, uh, children ombudsmen, the situation will be the same. So they are decisive in, in order to continue this policy of forcible adoption, of forcible deportations, and so on. This, uh, so they are like uh, good uh, clients for the ICC and uh, our national justice. And uh, we... Uh, we shouldn't be afraid that the situation uh, will be aggravated. How is it will be aggravated? The Russian Federation refused to provide us with informational cards for these children. They refused uh, to help us uh, to identify these children. They refused to return these children back in Ukraine in groups. What they can do also? They can hide these children. Okay, but uh, we still don't have information by uh, Russia uh, about these children even now. They don't help us to identify them. We identify them by other forces. We, we can't do it even without Russia. So we, we, we should uh, start to do something more like uh, uh, in order to create more pressure to Russia. So I think that we, we can be more proactive. And uh, this uh, situation when uh, we uh, are trying to find uh, and to implement the policy of appeasement uh, is uh, the way to uh, Novia. Mm -hmm. So there isn't much room for more aggravation. Mm -hmm. oh, I um, appreciate the answer. It, it's, uh, I, I agree. <laughs> it was just a thought that uh, came to my mind, but I agree that we should go all in and use all the methods and all the means we can. Thank you very much. Um, are there any more questions? Please raise your hands. It seems like like um, there are no more questions. Uh, so, Katarina and Alona, thank you so much for your the hard work that you do to um, document Russian war crimes. Thank you for your human rights um, work to protect the victims. Um, thank you for also for joining the space and sharing your experience. And also, thank you to everybody who joined. Thank you for caring about Ukraine. Thank you for being with us. So. Keep tuned, there will be many more um, Twitter spaces coming up where we will talk about war crimes, um, including deportations and other aspects of the war. So have a wonderful evening, everybody, and till we meet again. Thank you so much. Thank you, for Thank you so much. Bye-bye.